this does not look like a mosque to you, does it? Probably looks like something that should be in Florence, maybe Venice, and all those other kind of Renaissance type towns that you imagine. And yet, this is a mosque. When I turned up and asked if the sausage on our pizza was pork before we tucked into it, they laughed at us and, and said, do you not realize that the whole town is Muslim? Just as the Catholic monarchs were kicking the Jews out through the Alhambra decree, going back on their word to let them live there peacefully as the prior um, rulers had, Sultan Bayezid II sent out his navy to pick these people up, these people of the book, these brethren, and give them safety in his lands. It's a reminder that as a Muslim of Europe, my forefathers always stood with the oppressed and they did what they could to protect them. And I think that was, you know, a really powerful lesson to learn in that moment as well. I'm actually feeling quite overwhelmed and a little bit emotional to see so many of you so soon after the kind of awful pandemic we've had that you've braved and come out here and, and you want to show this support and this love. And I wish I could name each and every one of you and thank you individually, but I can't and I don't have the time. But I do want to thank, first of all, the East London Mosque for hosting me today and for continuously supporting me throughout my endeavours and, and the work that I've tried to do, which I'll go into a bit later as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, I obviously want to thank Hugh and Brat for commissioning this book, without which I wouldn't be standing here. Um, and I do, I have to thank my mother who's sitting over there with her twin sister and my brother over there um, for being such a wonderfully supportive family. Um, but most of all, I have to thank the people who have to put up with me. My wife, who's over the back there with um, a young girl who's wearing a matching outfit to me. That's my youngest daughter, Maya. And my two daughters, who are probably going to hate me for pointing them out, are over to the right. They'll be selling books later, Amani and Anaya. Those of you who have read the book already know them in some capacity. All right, so obviously you've already heard from Tim McIntosh-Smith. But I, I want to leave his quote, his actual endorsement up here, because that's what this book is all about. And, you know, Tim, as, as he pointed out, was a huge inspiration to me. I picked up his book many, many years ago when we were living in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And I didn't know there was such a thing as Muslim travelers before that. I didn't know that Muslim travel writers had explored the entire world. And, and that in itself was A, a shambles, but B, became a huge inspiration. And I remember reading Tim's book and being jealous of him and wanting to do what he was doing. So it feels very, very kind of bizarre to have somebody of his esteemed um, scholarly position to say he's jealous of what I'm doing. Um, but I want to draw your attention to Tim's quote here, which is the endorsement that um, appears on the websites and, and I think the next round of our books as well. Um, and it says, you're has long turned a blind eye, or worse, looked askance at its own Islamic self, the Muslims of the Balkans. Um, and that's really what this is about, because if we flick to the next slide, you'll see that this book began in that summer known as the summer of Brexit. And I was standing, I think, in another room here somewhere, and I was introducing as many people as I could to the idea that there is an indigenous European Muslim identity. We had an exhibition. I can see many of the brothers who have returned and the sisters who have returned um, who were there. And of course, the Grand Mufti of Lithuania was there. And this was the first time many people realized that this kind of presence, this living presence, because I'd, I'd explored the Islamic history of Europe for a very, very long time. I'd, you know, I don't want to use the word drag, but I certainly did at times drag my family around all over Europe and often on my own and sometimes with friends to explore this history and especially in Al-Andalus which most of us are now very familiar with which means some good work has been done and I always thought that was going to be the book I was going to write you know the, a book on Spanish Islam because it was so romantic and we imagined these wonderful people with huge turbans walking around acting very cultured and you know creating great things and what have you but I realized that History is dead, often, in the eyes of people. And to write a book about something that can be dismissed 
as history wasn't going to have the impact that I was seeking. And it became really apparent during this summer. And I, I've plastered these images, which you've all seen on your Facebooks. If you do a Google image, you'll see it. I think that summer, the kind of vitriolic xenophobia that sadly simmers beneath our society really surfaced in a horrific way. And some of you that have read my book already know that it brought back some awful, awful traumatic memories. And many of you I've grown up with, you shared those memories of being made to feel like you didn't belong. And that's what this is about. You know, we left in that summer after doing the exhibition here, feeling really good about introducing the idea, but we left quite relieved. Because as you can see from these headlines, there was a focus not just on Muslims, but it was immigrants in particular, and particularly immigrants from that part of Europe that my book is about. And that summer, if we can click one more time, that summer, that message that I started my talk with in 2016 when I was standing here in ELM was reinforced. Back one, sorry, back one. That message that Islam in particular and Muslims are not of Europe. And that's what I set out to disprove. I don't know why I had to disprove it. These people are living there. But it seemed like it wasn't common knowledge. And so we went off on this journey. And what I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes, because I'm not going to do a reading or anything like that, um, I'm going to give you some of the glimpses of the heritage that I and my family um, came upon and made us feel like, you know, this was a journey that really anchored our identity, but not in a historical way, in a way that says to everybody, it's still there, it's living, it's never gone away. Um, so the journey, you will see, I've titled it Muslim Europe, um, took us through six countries, three of which are the closest we might have to Muslim European countries, if we assess them by population. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Albania, and Kosovo are all Muslim majority. Now that in itself is a shock to a lot of people, that there are Muslim European countries. Now I'm not saying their constitution is Muslim, but nor is Bangladesh's. But I'm pretty sure most of us see Bangladesh as a Muslim country because of the sheer weight of the Muslim population. So we wanted to go through those three countries in particular. Our journey started and finished in Sarajevo, up there in the top. This map is over there for anyone that wants to have a look later. And then what we did was, um, my wife and I deliberately planned to go through those areas in other countries like Serbia, Montenegro and North Macedonia where we knew that there were still large numbers of Muslims living or there was really deep Islamic heritage still apparent. Because as anybody who's read the introduction knows, a lot of that has been wiped away. It was a systematic effort to wipe away that heritage, an effort that we later saw was then imposed on the people, something we've recently, we, we hold an event here every year to remember. Um, and here you can see the different places we went through, stuck narrowly to the three countries that are Muslim majority. One, because it was practical. You know, you can only take your kids so many miles up a road to see a mosque before they get fed up. So I had to stick to something that also allowed them to find beaches, lakes, waterfalls, and all the stuff I didn't write about in the book. Um, it was very much a, um, you know, a holiday, and, and believe me, it certainly wasn't like a history field trip or something like that. Because if it had been that, they'd never go away with me again. Okay, um, so that's the, that's the essence of the route. I'm now going to give you a few glimpses. So if we go to the first slide, Mostar Bridge. We'll, we'll go straight in with the hard and heavy stuff because also because this, was, this talk was originally going to be squeezed in between Srebrenica Memorial Day and Eid. But of course, um, Boris had something to say about that. So this bridge, most of you know it by now because it gets plastered all over um, you know, Muslim websites, Facebook, and even conventional travel sites. But what a lot of people don't know until they get there is that's not the original. The original was blown up during the 90s war, and it was deliberately blown up because this bridge wasn't just built by anybody. It was built by one of the greatest Muslim rulers to have lived, the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, and, and mistakenly for a while thought to be uh, a construction of Mimar Sinan, who of course is a great architect as well. And it was a systematic effort. One Harvard observer called it a cultural genocide because these, these monuments were systematically targeted to eradicate the Muslim identity of 
this beautiful bridge. This bridge blew away travelers in every sense when they visited it. Um, and after it collapsed, a, a huge effort was made by the locals, in particular one um, architect who lived locally, and he was determined to rebuild it, to, to resurrect the identity, and to also say, no, you are not going to take this away from us. And they did. And you can see it's almost identical. Any of you who have seen the pictures, I've got a really tiny stamp over there <laughs> that has it, so you can compare it to that. Um, but essentially what they did was they brought in um, experts in Ottoman um, archi architecture, sorry, architects, um, and they also retrieved the actual original stones and rebuilt it as faithfully as possible. So for me, this represents the, the cultural genocide and, of course, the real human genocide, but also the, the amazing spirit of the Bosnian people to continue in this space. Um, but also it's a, it's a beautiful monument. Next slide, please. Um, and this one, um, my, my wife is really angry that I keep going on about this particular place because she's the one who led me there and it was meant to be her little secret and um, she's really not happy about that. So I'm just publicly apologizing now. Okay, this is the Blagai Teki. As you can see, it's in a stunning location beneath a huge rock. Um, the bubbling waters of the River Buna um, come from beneath the rocks there and it is a Sufi lodge. Um, still active now. Today it's the, it's the home of the Naqshbandi order, but originally it was found, founded by a group known as the Bektashis. Um, and for me, this, there was two reasons this is significant. One, it was such a beautiful place. Two, it was one of the places that I felt I personally connected with the Ottoman traveller Elia Celebi, whose footsteps I was trying to follow in. It was very difficult because unfortunately a lot of Celebi's work hasn't been translated, but there was enough. And so it was special for that reason. Um, of course, it was special because my wife discovered it. Well, not really discovered it, but, you know, led me there. Um, but it was also special because this was the first time I realized that we had a European Muslim mystical Islamic tradition that I had known nothing about as well. So this, too, was my heritage. The previous slide was about a darker heritage. This was a mystical heritage. Moving on. Um, so this particular individual who I called Effendi the whole time I was there, he's holding a book. Um, which is actually a book of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, and the book itself is older than Sarajevo. And the reason I wanted to put this up here is because this is in a tiny library in a city called Zanicha, which I was um, led to by a wonderful friend who's in the book for two chapters, Mevluddin, who I actually met at the memorial event that we had back then. And it's Mevluddin's hometown. Um, and I went there and I thought, you know, he's just going to show me these kind of very minor little places possibly of interest or not, because that's how little we know about it. And he leads me to his library, and this is just one of several books that this gentleman pulled out to highlight what lies in store there. And I imagine if this was a book in a country like the UK or whatever, it'd find its way to somewhere like the British Museum. But we have a long way to go on that front. When I say we, I mean us as Muslims of Europe. Next slide. Um, and so this is the tomb of Sultan Murad I. And the reason he's there, you can flick to the next one as well because it's the same. Yeah. And that's his actual um, sarcophagus, I guess. And um, that's his Tugra, his insignia at the back. Um, and so this was an interesting place for two reasons. One, it was in Kosovo. And anyone that knows the history of Kosovo knows how difficult it is to get in and out of that country. Not because Kosovans are difficult, but because certain countries around them make it difficult. And so I nearly didn't make it to this place. Um, and again, you know, having a brave family around me helped. Um, and in the end, we decided to day trip and we had to go in from Serbia and we had to come back to Serbia because had we left through any other country into North Macedonia, which is what we wanted to do, we would have left Serbia illegally and basically become what they call when you're on the run. Refugees. No, not refugees, the other ones. Fugitive. When you're fugitive. Yeah, we would have become Serbian fugitives. Um, but the reason he is so significant and I had to make an effort to get there is because Sultan Murad was the one who led the Ottomans into Europe proper. So it was after a, a war um, on, this play, on this actual space, which was known as the um, Plain of Kosovo, or the Kosovan Plain, um, that Sultan Murad, alongside other non-Muslims, fought against the kind of waning Byzantine remnants. They won, and the Ottomans arrived, and then Islam arrives in this part of Europe. And that's why it was significant for me, because I, I think I call him the grandfather of Muslim Europe, because it's through him we have a living Muslim legacy still. Because just as he was coming in, of course you know what was happening in Spain. 
the Muslims were being asked to leave, as were the Jews. And I'll come back to the Jews a bit later. Um, so it was really, really significant in that respect. And um, it was obviously, it's obviously a very, very important monument and remains the site of pilgrimage for many people to this day. Um, so this, this is the clock tower in Skopje, and I've put this up here because it made me sad. And it's also on my front cover because I loved it so much. And Ollie, did a, Ollie Davis, by the way, did a fantastic job of depicting it. I said to him, I want that on there. And people think it's a minaret. It's not. It's a clock tower. And the reason I put this up here is it made me sad. You can see the attempts to fix it. It, it looks like a Soviet block building in the bottom half. But the top half is wonderfully quaint and, and very, very beautiful. But the reason I, I, I was sad is because this clock tower was next to an imperial mosque, a mosque by a sultan that had been completely neglected, was falling apart, and um, nobody cared about it. And it was in Skopje. And that's the other reason this is up here. I knew almost nothing about Skopje when I turned up there. And this place probably has more Muslim heritage in one square mile than anywhere else outside of Turkey. Sorry, Ottoman heritage. It's unbelievable how much there is. I describe it as a Muslim Rome. And we know nothing about it because obviously there are, there are factors, um, there, are, there are things going on that I don't want to go into in too much detail, but there are individuals who want to try and replace that heritage with some very strange statues, um, which I won't go into right now. But um, essentially, North Macedonia, the previous administration, wanted to align itself with the Hellenic, which is... Um, the Macedonian heritage of antiquity that is associated with Alexander the Great. But um, I do remember my daughter asking me, did Alexander come here? And, and I made the point that he never did. So we're not quite sure how they're doing that. But the point being, there's all this Islamic heritage which is being overlooked. Um, and this was an example of it, the Great Mosque. But also, this signified just how important Skopje was. Because Skopje was the first place that the Ottomans felt was important enough to build a clock tower in mainland Europe. Now, a clock tower was a big thing, you know, before iPhones and watch phones and whatever else we're doing now. This was the only way people could tell time in the whole town. So to put one in there, that was indicating just how significant this place is. And most of us probably have never been there. Um, and some of us may never have even heard of it up to this point. So again, another indicator of the heritage that, you know, we, we aren't aware of. Next slide. And another one that blew me away. So this is actually in Albania. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Albania because Albania gets a lot of stick and we needed to made it in, make it into Albania because I'm susceptible to that. We're all susceptible to it. it we all buy into the popular imagination of a place or a, or a people if it's not us. If it's us, we challenge it. But if it's not us, we tend to buy into it regardless. And so even I was very, very nervous. And, and again, anyone who's read the first few chapters in Albania can see that I get nervous about stuff. As a seasoned traveller, normally I'd just brush off as insignificant and just the trials and tribulations of being on the road but eventually I realized that this has come from a deeper darker place and that place is the historical way in which writers of the English language in particular have portrayed this part of Europe as the other and for me it's the reason why it's still identified as Eastern Europe it's not quite Europe when it needs a qualifier and I think this has played a massive role in alienating the indigenous Muslim heritage of Europe. By othering that place, you are also saying that it's not really us. And I think that's quite interesting and something that needs to be examined because if I, if I hadn't made it, I would have missed this town called Jirakasta and another one, Berat, in particular, both of which look like fairy tale villages straight out of the pages of Evliya Chelebi's travels. In fact, a lot of it still looks like what Evliya Chelebi describes, except the mosques, the synagogues, and the churches have been done away with, because anyone who knows the Albanian history knows that Enver Hoxha wanted to make it the first atheist state in the world. And so he systematically eradicated religion and made it very, very difficult. But this particular building is a stunning example of one of the monuments that just sits there and we know almost nothing about. Um, and this is um, a coffee seller, clearly. Um, I, I put him up there because um, we went to a town called Novi Pazar in Serbia. And before we went to Serbia, I did, I'd never even met a Serbian Muslim. And, and so when I turned up and asked if the sausage on our pizza was pork before we tucked into it, they laughed at us and, and said, do you not realize that the whole town is Muslim? Um, and then as we were eating our pizza, this kind of seemingly a choir of Muslim women, girls in hijab started singing Nasheed on the stage out in the middle of it. It was very surreal, is what I'm saying. 
and this is in Serbia, where I don't think many of you would have realized that there's any Islam at all. But one of the most beautiful pieces of Islamic heritage or European Muslim heritage that I discovered there was the adoption by the local business makers of the tradition of looking after the traveler. Um, most of you, um, some of you will be aware that um, in, in Islamic culture, I think it comes from pre-Islamic culture, but it's certainly adopted by Muslims. When you have somebody stay with you who's a traveler, you, you should look after them for three days, three nights, at, at your cost. In other words, don't burden them, ideally. I know that's ridiculously impossible in London, but we do try still. Um, now, the best example of it was during the Ottoman period, all the caravanserais, if you turned up, regardless of your faith, who you were, what you did, you were looked after for three days and three nights, including your horses, your cattle and whatever, and the sultan picked up the bill. So it was, it was a very strong tradition, is what I'm saying. When I went to pay for the coffee, this guy refused because I was a musafir, because I was a traveler. And another guy refused when I was with my girls, and they were having candy floss. And the, he just flat refused. He couldn't even explain it. He just, and I thought he wanted more money, and, and I feel very guilty about that in the book because I'm used to going to tourist places where they want more money, not less or none. Um, but it was wonderful and it, and it made me feel very, very emotional to come across that piece of heritage and, and also to embrace it as mine. Finally, I think, no, one more after this. This does not look like a mosque to you, does it? Probably looks like something that should be in Florence, maybe Venice, and all those other kind of Renaissance type towns that you imagine. And yet, this is a mosque. And where you might have seen a cherub, an angel, or, or a Christian monument, these are actually places, apart from the flowers, places of is significance to the Muslims in the locality in North Macedonia. Um, and the reason this dome is up here is because it, it epitomizes, and I think Brack tweeted this today, didn't you? Yeah, it epitomizes probably the most European Muslim piece of art heritage that has ever been constructed. Um, and it's known as the Ottoman tulip style, popularly known as that, I don't know if it's formally, but popularly known as the Ottoman tulip style, where it brings together European Baroque styles and it brings it in with Islamic calligraphy and Islamic artistic traditions. And um, I remember being in this place for all of two minutes because the caretaker just growled at me the whole time and wanted me out, um, and just being blown away by this space. We saw remnants of this all over the region, by the way, but this was the place where it was the most vivid because these guys were very proud of their mosque and they invested in it and they constantly maintained it and apparently it took 30,000 eggs. Is that right? I think we tweeted that today. 30,000 eggs to paint this. That's not all they used, obviously. Um, yeah, so this is your European Muslim art heritage right there. It's a style of art that you probably didn't know about and it's ours. Last one. And finally, um, a synagogue in this. We, we, went past a lot of synagogues and I visited quite a few, most of them closed, um, you all know why. Um, but the reason I've got this here is because um, I had quite a, a moment in front of this synagogue because I was using a, an app locally um, which was sending me around, as you do nowadays, you know, go visit this place and it was a trail, like the kind of trails that I like to create. And it was a trail called the Ottoman Trail and the uh, um, Revolution, Serbian Revolution. So, you know, I know Jews had nothing to do with the Serbian Revolution, so I know it was connected to the Ottomans, but the, tr the app refused to tell me why. And so I was a bit annoyed about that. I got there and I looked around and I couldn't find any evidence at all. I knew because I, I looked into this stuff, but I was annoyed that they didn't. I, I understand why the Serbians have issues with Ottomans. They committed a lot of atrocities there. This is not by any attempt to try and lionize the Ottomans or get you all watching Erturul because, God, we've done enough of that. Um, this was really for me to say, look, why can't you acknowledge that the reason this is on an Ottoman trail, is because the Ottomans picked up the baton that the Umayyads had all that time in protecting the most persecuted religious group in Europe for almost 12 centuries. And I don't think any of us have ever thought about it like that. I hadn't until that moment. And so I started off angry that they hadn't acknowledged it, and then I started to realize why I was angry, and then I connected it to the Umayyads because just as the Catholic monarchs were kicking the Jews out through the Alhambra decree, going back on their word to let them live there peacefully as the prior um, rulers had. Sultan Bayezid II sent out his navy to pick these people up, these people of the book, these brethren, and give them safety in his lands. Um, yeah, I mean, there were probably other reasons, you know. They, they probably did wonders for places where there weren't many people living, um, and it might have even um, started the economy in places, whatever. But the point is, he didn't have to do that, and he did. 
And it was the reason why the Sephardic Jews in particular, that's the Spanish Jews, continued to be in Europe right up until, of course, the Nazi atrocities. And so to stand there and realize that was a part of my heritage was a very, very powerful moment, given what's going on in world politics, which is not for me to talk about now. But I think it's a reminder that as a Muslim of Europe, my forefathers always stood with the oppressed and they did what they could to protect them. And I think that was, you know, a really powerful lesson to learn in that moment as well. So that was your run through. Um, now, I just want to thank you again and just remind you that we've got a few things going on. You may have, you've probably seen all the stuff that's actually here, but myself and um, Brother Philippe who, who um, you know, spoke about what we're going to have going on. We wanted to make it as COVID friendly as possible and not put loads of pictures everywhere for you to stand around. So actually there's loads of QR codes. If you scan them, there's a gallery with captions of the journey that you can watch. There's videos, there's interviews and stuff, just so you can do that without having to stand around with people. There are of course two small um, exhibits of my own um, collection. Over there is more kind of Balkan Ottoman focus. Over there is more other Europe and then quite a few bits on Muslim Britain. Um, don't forget the signed copies. I think someone's already won one of those post signed prints that I'm also giving away with anyone who gets a book that's got a gold star on it. Um, there's a block map of the route and of course you've already enjoyed many of the Ottoman style refreshments. So all that leaves me to say is thank you very much for coming and for having me here. Thank you, Brother Tariq, for your very um, beautiful, charismatic, informative um, presentation. A lot of things I've learned tonight, and um, I'm sure if, you, if we read the book, inshallah, we'll be learning much, much more about uh, our Muslim European heritage. <coughs> so if you have any questions at the moment um, for Brother Tariq, we can take a few questions, inshallah. Yeah. So, um, lady there. So it was, the, it was in a town called Nis in Serbia, um, which I, I didn't want to take up too much time and you know, nobody would read the book then. Um, Nis is a town that was interesting because it, when, when Elia Celebi went there, um, there was a picture in a, in a book called the Leiden um, Pilgrim's Book, um, which shows it almost like a bed of needles, like the ones you see in those stereotypical places apparently Indian fakirs once used to sleep on. It looked like that. It was full of minarets. And today Nis has um, one mosque, that's been converted into a um, gallery and um, no other mosque that really function. Well, there's one other mosque, but we're not sure if it works. And it has 1% Muslim population. So it just shows how in different parts the ethnic cleansing took place in quite a dark and dramatic way. Yes, Afghan Bay. Yeah, so um, obviously there is also quite a Ottoman heritage in that region of the world. And um, for our trip, we only popped over to Dubrovnik because we didn't, we didn't go to Croatia on this trip. We actually did it many, many years ago. Um, but back then, I wasn't really as focused on Islamic heritage. But the short answer is, there's Islamic heritage in all that part. Um, but to discover it, you will have to go back to look at it through lens other than um, historic white middle-class, middle-aged writers. So this is why Evliya Chebri was so important to me. Because without his eyes on certain places, I couldn't have told you how Islamic it was. I could only see what was there. But it was eradicated in such a way in, uh, that it was impossible to, to make that. And Elia Chelebi, by the way, the, the 17th century Ottoman traveler, was traveling just after um, the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. So it was the most expansive the Ottoman Empire ever was. And it was at the height of its cultural and artistic zenith. So that's why it was the most Muslim that region was going to be. A huge congratulations, Eric, for writing this amazing book. Uh, I don't normally finish a book within two or three sittings. <laughs> I did in this case. Wow. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's a much needed book for Muslims in Europe uh, and also for non-Muslims in Europe. Yes, yes. Uh, because, uh, as we know, the, the, the glue that keeps society together are the stories we, we mm -hmm. share. Mm -hmm. And uh, this really gives us the kind of stories that we need to unify uh, European Muslims and non-Muslims. The question <laughs> I had uh, really is um, to do with... Um, uh, what you mentioned during your speech, yeah. which is the initial book yes. you wanted to write, was uh, Spanish European Muslim heritage. Yeah. 
And this story, the story of Muslims in Europe, is really um, half told unless exactly. you actually cover that side. So, so are you actually thinking of, you know, um, completing a series on the history of uh, Muslims in Europe? Uh, is that something? Well, you're well I'm hoping about? all the um, rich people I've invited are going to give me a huge chunk of money to do that. <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, I'd love to. You know, I'd love to write about it and find an angle that hasn't been covered. And of course, the, the history of that part of the world um, is, is it, it takes it back to the first generation. You know? um, and this is something we spoke about in my, um, in my exhibition the first time around where we, when we were here. Um, and we explained that the first generation of Muslims, the, the, the actual Sahabas and Sahabis of the Prophet وسلم, actually came to Cyprus. Um, and, and we know that his aunt was buried there. Uh, and there's a mosque dedicated to her called the Khala Sultan Teki. And, and Khala means Khala like my aunt here. We all call our aunts Khalas in Bengali as well, so <laughs> that's where the word comes from. And so we know that Islam was never anywhere else, it was in Europe straight away. And that's something we need to kind of normalize. And, and I, I'm so glad you made that point because obviously I'm talking about the book and the title is Muslim Europe and it, and it sounds devi div divisive almost. And I've, and I've got non-Muslim um, family myself. I've got non-Muslim friends in the place. You know, as I said to one, one interviewer recently, I hope one day I'm writing this and this is just European history. This isn't to divide, it's to address an imbalance. You know, and as with any imbalance, when the imbalance is so great, you have to come with something heavier. Just, just on scales. When, you, when, you, when it's really heavy on one side, you have to put something heavier on the other side. Probably me, judging by... <laughs> and so, that's why it's got the title it has. That's why it's meant to put a few people's backs up. But it's stating the fact. It's not doing something bizarre, hopefully. Yes? So, on your travels of um, Islamic heritage, of historical Europe, what have you found has had an influence on modern Europe? It's a question of what haven't I found, but I suppose the most, I, I think the most powerful thing before this book, long before this book, is when I was, when I was spending time wandering, literally almost religiously visiting Andalusia during the early 2000s, um, was the realization that the bedrock and the foundations of the Renaissance was actually in Al Andalus. So that's probably, because of course the Renaissance is then credited with the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is credited with modern society. So I suppose in a big, kind of cheating way. I'm just saying, yeah, we, we did the Renaissance. Because <laughs> during the Dark Ages, it wasn't dark over there. So clearly that had to come from somewhere, you know, or, or, all of the works, and it did. And we know it did because the, the historical evidence is there. Places like Toledo became translation centers, and from there it transported all over the world. Um, you know, the, the, the Latin speakers translated all the works into Latin, and, and, and that is probably our greatest intellectual legacy, certainly. Brother Abdullah Falik is actually the main architect behind this event. He did uh, most of the work in the background to make this event successful, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. He's a member of Islam Mosque and he helps us to organize uh, this kind of events throughout the year. Yeah, so this is someone I've known since I was literally a baby, almost. Um, and he has unwaveringly supported me and always shared my vision. And if he hasn't believed in it, he's certainly backed it. So I just wanted to present this. 